Okay, so guys, so last time we read through the Gemara in Sanhedrin um, and the Gemara in Erechen to try to figure out, do we, is it likely that we believe that non-Jews have a chiyuv in Staka? Because obviously whether or not we want to take, we, we, we are open to taking Staka from them, which were the Gemaras we started with in Baba Batra, and whether there should be a problem with that, much of that is based on the question of are they obligated, or if not obligated, is there a value, whatever you want to call that value, and we'll see what that is. Um, so what we're going to do today is try to pin that down a little bit, okay? And, you know, unfortunately for confusion purposes, fortunately for Yonatan, but unfortunately for the rest of us for confusion, you know, it's Yonatan 1 versus Yonatan 2, but whatever, we'll have to... Um, <laughs> Um, based on last time, but that's but that's fine. So, let's do a little Chazara. The Gemara in Sanhedrin Nunvav, which discusses the mitzvot of Bnei Noach. The basic accepted position is how many mitzvot do they have? Seven. There are fir- a few expansions there. Additions, not expansions. Uh, additions, Sirus, what? Sorcery. Sorcery. Um, but none of them are stuck up. So if you just stop that Gemara, possibility one, non-Jews are not high in stock according to anybody. Possibility two, which is what Yonatan suggested, which is that not knowing that he was drawing on the Sefer HaChinuch's theory in general about Shev Mitzvah or maybe he did know that and just was humble and didn't mention it, was that the Chinuch believes that the Sheva Mitzvot are not Mitzvot, they're categories of Mitzvot. Um... So, therefore, you know, for example, right, you could say that, you know, for Jews, Geneva and Gazela are different categories, right? Stealing in, in private, stealing, right, highway robbery, right? Those are different. One of them, you're Chayev Kefel, one of them, you're, you're not. Those are different categories. But for non-Jews, it might plausibly all be under Gezel, don't steal, not as a highway robber, not as a, right, not as a pickpocket, not as sneaking in, right, etc. Yeah. Double, right? If you steal in private, you pay double. And if you steal a sheep, right? And if you steal a sheep or a, or an ox, you you pay four or five times, right? No, you not pay eight times. No. Um, the next gemara that we looked at was Sanhedrin Nun Zion Amud Beis. Now the gemara and someone remind me what happened in the gemara in Sanhedrin Nun Zion Amud Beis. Right, the Gemara had said, aren't women Chayev and Dinan? Because the puzzle by Avram says that Avram was chosen because he could, um, he, to- he was going to teach his children Tzedek Mishpat. And the Gemara answered, no, maybe women are only Chayev and Staka, not the Mishmat part. But that implies that non Jews are indeed Chayev in this thing called Staka. Right, that was the implication. And if you, you, you wanted it not to be the implication, then no, it wasn't a commandment. No, no, it was God explaining. Now you could say it's not an obligation. It's just what God is saying. Look, I like that Avram's going to teach this. Yes, um, there. So there are two ways to put to to negate the proof from that pasuk. One is to say what you're saying is no. That shows you it's valuable for all of humanity. That doesn't mean that it's a chiyuv. The second is to say that who said staka in the pasuk means what we're talking about as staka. Right. By the way, how many times in Chumash does the Torah command us to give charity? Give charity. Three. Zero. Yeah, yeah. Zero. Yeah. It's zero, but people make a mistake here because it's not right. They they think of all these mitzvot, but those mitzvot are not technically talking about charity. They're talking about the mitzvot to lend them money, right? They're talking about right for Chazal. They expand it to charity per se, but right in very good. It's not charity, right? There's a mitzvah of leket shechon peah. That's not charity. That's the mitzvah of. 
Right? That's the mitzvah of Matzanot Aniyim. What? No, it's not. So first of all, it's not because the Gemara, as the Gemara points out in several places, you don't give it, you leave it. Right? Guys, 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 I cannot, there are too many people, I like that you're arguing with each other, but Matzanot but, Aniyim are not charity. Meaning, not in the sense, I said give charity. They're not charity that you give. You're not allowed to give it. You have to leave it. But it's charity. No, but I, I said give charity. Yeah. You don't, the Gemara says, you don't give it, you leave it. There's a difference. You don't get to choose who you give it to because you're not giving it, it's being left. In Nidarim, this comes up a lot, where the Gemara says that even if you say that poor person is not allowed to benefit from me and you make a ned there, they're allowed to take Matnod Aniyam from you, but they're not allowed to take Staka from you. Could Staka you give him? Matana, you don't. You leave them, and whoever takes them, takes them. They're Hefker. They're not yours. Right? Plus, you wouldn't be any star from it being Staka. It's, it's not Staka, it's Matana Aniyam. You are obligated to leave it. But they're not, it's not coming from you. Your obligation is to leave it. Who takes it is not your business. So right? That's very different. Your interaction with it ends when you leave it. Correct. And that's why I said, I was very careful. I said, give charity. Not. Does the Torah ever command you to take care of the poor? The answer to that question is a resounding yes in many, many, many places. But it's very rare, right? It's, it's arguable that it ever happens, right? That's why I said zero. There are for certain times that you could. The Torah commands you to leave part of your field so they can take it. The Torah commands you that when you're having meals on Yom Tov to invite the poor to be part of your family and provide for them that way. Right? But not to give them till they go to your house, so that they be with you. Right? right? That they will be misameach with you. It commands you to lend them money. It says that if you lend them money and they don't pay you back by Shemitah, you wipe away the loan, which retroactively turns into charity, but wasn't when you gave it. So there are a lot of ways in which I provide for the poor, but they're not in the ways that we classically think of. That's not really what happens in Chumash so much. Yeah. So Meiser Ani is, is interesting. Right, Miser Ani, you could argue is charity, maybe, but it's hard because it's more of a like maybe it is, but remember, it's part of the agricultural taxes, which always go to the Kohanim and the Levim, and then one year out of three, right, part of that taxes goes to the poor, and that's why I said, right, it's not really, maybe it's charity, maybe it's hard to say, right, it's not really charity in the way you would think. Well, maybe. Again, my point is that, my point being that the Torah doesn't really talk about so much what we talk about. It talks about taking care of the poor, right? But the fact that we even have to quibble about it, right? We could argue that, Maizarani, every third year you have, every third year, so then you have a tax which goes to charity. We could argue that that's charity if you want, even though that specifically is not staka, right? Meaning, that might be charity, but it's not staka, right? So there is, <laughs> if you want to find a time in, What? It's my Sarani, it's Maser. It's one of the tithes. What? Oh, because it is implied within some of these, right? But it's not. The point is that it's not the Iker. Why is it not the Iker? Right? This is really a share from another time. The reason is simply because in an agricultural world where most people. and with a barter economy, charity is a very. in the way that we conceptualize it is not really a, a helpful category. Saying you should give them a portion of the produce, or now lechet shechan are more than that, right? Because like lechet shechan it's like you know how at the end of the the field, the, the end of the um, harvest process, if you don't want there to be molding fruit in your field, you have to go out and clean whatever sort of fell while you were harvesting. Okay, you don't know, but you would do this, right? So the so when you say that the poor people get all the stuff that you drop. Right? It's true that you're let it, giving them food, but uh, you're also, they're, they're getting the food that you would have had to go and clean up later, meaning they're actually doing uh, minimal labor to get that food also. So it's, that's why it's hard to say it's really charity, right? It's, it's just not the same. That's my point, okay? What? Paya is, is more directly going to them, but it's specifically not giving it to them. It's leaving for them, and that's why I said it's different. There are, as I said, there are cases where we provide for the poor, but giving charity, that's not giving charity. Again, 
the Chazal go out of your way to tell you it's not giving. If it were giving, it's a problem. You're not allowed, for example, to collect peya and then hand it out to the poor people. You're not allowed to do that. You have to leave it. Right? You're not allowed to do that because you're not allowed to give it. You have to tazov. You have to leave it alone. Yeah. No. No. I'm going to let Adam because his his hand has been falling off and he's too polite to butt in. So I'm going to I'm going to butt in for him. Yeah. It could be, right? I mean, it's a little bit weird just because you would probably have harvested it yourself because it's actually a corner of your field, right? But yes, you are making them harvest, right? It's it, There is a l- certain labor component there which blurs the line here. Right. And also, if you bring in the definition of Sadaka, it would say that there is an aspect of the of the voluntary. Right, and that's why I said my Sarni is a little bit interesting because it's a tax. Right, Maisarni is a tax. It's not a... Right. right, and that's another thing. It's part of agricultural taxes, which two out of every three years, you take that money for yourself. It's not even... It's a tax to yourself that you have to just eat the Kedusha and Yerushalayim. Right? So that's why I'm saying, is it is it really... You know, Staka, eh, you know. Yes, Rami. Um, is there any actual trouble, like, like with Mata? Limits on uh, for people who collect uh, You have to be poor. What is it? What is it? There are actual parameters, but I'm not going to go through Masechet Peah for you. But yes, there are actual parameters of what what mean what does poor mean? Oh, okay, fine. So it's not, okay. It's not no, no, no. We have an objective definition for poor. poor. Yes. Okay. Below the poverty line. Uh, I was wondering if I could just. Yes, but, but very good. Below the poverty line. <laughs> For the record, even the most even the most impoverished people that they talk about living below the poverty line probably don't fit the definitions in the Gemara and the Mishnah of poor for these purposes. But that's part of our conversation that we were talking about during Seder, and part of why you know I believe what I do about economics, knowing what poor used to mean. Okay, but that's a story for another time, Yonah, and I can argue with this later. Um, what? <laughs> saying we're, we're talking having in the entirety of their possession the only enough food for a very limited number of meals exactly how much and under what circumstances again is Masechah Peya for you a homeless person having a tarp so having a tarp tarp like, yeah he has his homeless tarp is that like not for well a tarp I don't know a tarp he might that's all he had might be but if he had like a no, five bucks would probably be fine. But if he had a car, for example, right? even if he lived out of his car, I don't know. It wouldn't be obvious, right? Or if he had anything that was sellable, right? it would not be obvious. What if someone has debt? Like if they had like assets worth like $10,000, but it also made $10,000 debt, say that they were homeless, they would have to pay that back in some I doubt it. I know that's how like modern economics will sometimes talk, but really, right? Do you really think that like, I, the Torah would not... I don't think the Torah would believe that, like... Let's take most people my age, okay? N- maybe not in Israel, but in America. Right? This is more true. In Israel, it's not. But in America, where you're able to take out a mortgage of 10%. Okay? That's standard. In Israel, you can't take less than 30, so it's a little bit different. Okay? Yes. 30. 30 is minimum. Minimum. 30 per... What? Down payment, minimum 30. Minimum 30. Oh! In a, in a, in a, <laughs> no, not no. I'm saying how much you have to put down. I'm saying in, in Israel it's minimum thirty, which makes a big difference because in America. But my point is that in Ameri- in America, right? Let's say you buy a half a million dollar house, right? And you have a salary that totally right that makes that totally legitimate. But you ju- right, you have a you make a quarter million dollars a year, right? But you put down a ten percent mortgage, right? So at that moment. You have fifty thousand dollars, right, in equity, yeah. but you have four hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt. So by right by American standards, you are now right negative, right negative. Fifty thousand dollars in equity, like I mean, 
You put the day you take the mortgage, you fifty. You put fifty thousand down. I feel like in that case you're double counting the debt. Though. You're saying you're, you're saying the amount of money you owe one comes out of the amount of the house you owe, and plus on top of that. It's no, 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 no. When they would calculate your value, it would be you owe four hundred fifty thousand dollars, and you have fifty thousand dollars to your name, so you are negative four hundred. It's negative four hundred. You're not double counting the debt. I mean, because if, like, because one year, let's say someone... Okay, I don't want to get into this. My point is that at that point, no. if someone, my point is that if someone at that point is considered having a negative, is coming having a negative net worth, right? Because he has more debt than he has assets, right? Because he has, right, he doesn't own his house yet, right? But if a guy makes a quarter million dollars a year and has no problem paying his mortgage payments... Right, and he chose to not pay his house. Right, you know, and he chose to put down ten percent so that he could be free to use that money for vacations and to use it to invest later on and things like that. There's no way in halacha that guy is impoverished, right? Just because he isn't right. Technically, he has more debt than he has, right? Yeah, but he would only get ten percent. Yeah, but you would actually no, but you would actually have penalties, right? You have penalties on early payment, so paying back the bank, you might end up owing money, right? More than that, it's complicated. Okay, my point is, my point is, okay, my entire point here, guys, my entire point here, guys, my point here was simply that no, the existence of debt, right, is not enough to make you poor. You can have debt and be functionally wealthy. That's my point. That's my point. That's it. That's it. I'm done. That's it. I'm done there. That's my point. Is that no debt is not enough to make you poor because you have money that you can spend right on food. So what if you're not your credit card? What if you have a credit card that, that got, what you got? I'm not going to start getting into details. My point is that was my point. I'm not getting into details. That's not for now. Okay. Uh, Because the Gemara tells you how many meals the person should has enough money in his total assets to buy. But how do you know that the Gemara... But that, that seems kind of like culture. No, it doesn't... Not that... Not for Matan... Not for Matan... Not for Matan... Not for Matan... Right? It, there's very specific numbers of how much food... Because it's for food. You have to be able to eat. Right? And the Gemara goes out of its way. Right? To explain what happens if someone... What? Poor for this purpose. There are definitions in other places. It's complicated. It's complicated. Okay, I'm moving on. I'm moving on from this. So, the point of this whole conversation was to note that staka doesn't always mean what we think of it. Staka. I mean, it was a fascinating 18-minute aside, but it's, but that's the point. Okay. With that in mind, let's go back to the Gemaras, okay? So, let's look at Rashi. Okay, Rashi, over here. This is Rashi. Okay, I gave it to you in Surah Adaf. Next time, maybe I won't. Okay? Um, so, let's read Rashi. Dine kinasot. Hosifu bimara de bne noah lo huzru alayen, de teva itsav, ve gamrin la masher itsave. Da hatam staka umishpat ktiv. Da hainu din upshara. Avoknasot lav mishpat nenu de kantin le tve mi dine. He says, What does the words staka umishpat mean in that context? Staka din and mishpat No, other way around. It wasn't in order, but mishpat means din, in and staka means pshara, meaning both of them have to do with judgment, justice. Mishpat means strict justice, and staka means compromise. What? Which is a machloket in the Gemara, in Sanhedrin Davav. Yes. Asur or mitzvah. Yes. Um, so, according to Rashi... Now, is that a better dif- 
What do you think? Is that a better definition on Nunzayin Amud Bet? Remember, Nunzayin Amud Bet says, Are women chayavot in dinin? No. And the Gemara says, No, because even though Avram was commanded staka o mishpat, maybe that refers to staka na mishpat. Now, in that case, does staka being more conceptually close to mishpat make more sense? No. Meaning, in the Pasuk, when the Gemara is saying, are, not, are women chayav in staka, in mishpat, and they say, maybe they only chayav in staka, in a phrase that says staka o mishpat, where mishpat clearly means dinin, setting up a court system, right? Or no, where they're not in charge of making them. They're obligated to have a system where people have civilized deals. Essentially, that's what Pshara is, right? Mediation. Same thing, I don't know. You, in, in Canada, you have very worked out lo- courts and you have very worked out mediation. You just do. In, in certain places, you're even obligated by law to attempt mediation before they'll accept you into the courts to try to take some of the onus off the court system. I don't know. Setting up mediation. So Rashi, though, at the very least, does Rashi think that staka in this sugya means charity? No, and if he doesn't think that stuck in this sugi means charity, are non-Jews chayev? No, because Nunvav doesn't mention it, and Nunzayin isn't talking about charity. You can disagree and say it's not a plausible read, but the point is that Rashi doesn't believe that the word there, staka, means what we are talking about. It's not about giving money to charity. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about pshara. It's talking about mediation. It's talking about compromise. And therefore, according to Rashi, it's pretty clear that are non-Jews chayev in staka? No. And what we call staka now. I know I'm switching terms. And what we call staka. Wait, so they, are in what? They, they might be chayiv in that, but that's not our question. Which one? Which, which, which They're which definitely chayiv in dinim. We call staka the dinim thing, or we call staka charity? What we call, I mean, remember, our sugya, we're talking about charity, okay? Let's, let's say, okay. we'll use the English. Are they obligated in the, whatever mitzvah charity is? No, because that's not what it's talking about. Nunvav doesn't mention it, and Nunzayin is talking about somebody, something else. All right, so Rashi's pretty clear. Yes, Yaakov. Well, it mentions staka, and in some places it might be talking about charity, or it might be charity by implication, but it's usually talking about loans, right? Giving loans to non to, so to poor people. The articulation of what we know at staka is mostly happens in the rabbinic level. Yes. So the What? No, no, not ch- what? No, no, no. Okay, let's try this again. What we called staka, the Torah never really talked about explicitly. It does hint at it in some of the mitzvot about lending money, where it might be about charity also, but the primary focus is usually... I'm not claiming there's no mitzvah del right of what we called staka. That's not what I'm claiming. I'm just saying that the Torah doesn't have a... Right, isn't doesn't elaborate on this too much. Most of the time, the Torah is talking about something else. We've wrapped it up in staka, but the Torah you, normally talks about lending money to lending money and leaving parts of your field, and that's why it gets confusing because we call staka giving. We call staka pretty much everything, right? Charity to poor people, donations to institutions, right? We would call matnot aniyim staka. We call everything staka, but it's not. Right, staka, which is just giving charity, not as part of agricultural tax and not as part of leaving it. Right, that when the Torah talks about it, it's primarily talking about lending the money. Chazal note that it does seem to also be discussing actually giving charity, but it's not the main focus of that unit. Right, the unit is more about lending money, keep, and, right, and then forgiving the loan during shemitah and all that, but not um, giving. There is a mitzvah to write of staka. Right, Chazal derive it from the psukim about lending money. Okay, I'm not denying that that's true. I'm just saying that it's not the focus of this unit. Um, then the question of, okay, are non-Jews chayiv in that thing that we call staka that we assume is a mitzvah doraita that Chazal derive? But that's not the point. They derive it, but we're assuming it exists. Are non-Jews chayiv? Nunvav mentions nothing about it. Not in the seven mitzvah. Not the additions. Nunzayin does mention it. But Rashi argues that in Anun Zayin, when it says that non-Jews might be having staka, it doesn't mean 
charity, it means mediation, compromise, as part of the legal system. Right? There's mishpat, which is strict justice, and there's staka, which is compromise. So according to Rashi, are we left with any source that would say the non-Jews are high in charity? No. no, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Right? There's no piece of evidence anywhere that they'd be chayev. Um, I didn't say not allowed to. Remember, I said before we get to the question of why it should be problematic, we have to figure out whether they're chayev. Methodical here. What? I didn't say they can't. Who said they can't? The Gemara said they can't under certain circumstances, but I didn't get there yet. Or, no, I, I should change that. The Gemara never says they can't. The Gemara says we shouldn't accept it under certain circumstances. We haven't gone there yet. If you look at number, the Gemara here from Ksuvos, Chedam and Bet, um, well, let's read it. Let's see what it might tell us about this. Amar of Yosef, Maikra, Kistom Hayinu, Amora Daminu. We were like Stom and Amora. Where's that from? What? Thank you, Gavi. First parak of Ishayahu, parak Aleph, Pazuk Chet, I believe. Maybe Tet. I think it's Chet, though. Maya Haderle, and the next Pasuk is Shemu Dvar Hashem Kitzine Sedom. Listen to the word of God, O officers of Sedom. So what does that add? That's Gemara's question, right? Those are two consecutive psukim in the first parak of Yeshayahu. You're all staring at me. What is Yeshayahu? What is this book? When do we read those psukim? We actually read them. They're a haftorah, a famous haftorah. Thank you, Gavi. Shabbat Chazon, the Shabbat before Tisha B'av. Well, that was not even close. Yes, it is Shabbat Chazon, Chazon Yeshayahu ben Amot. Um, Shabbat Chazon Shabbat Chazon The Shabbos before Tisha B'av Shabbat Nachamu The Shabbat after Both named for the Haftorahs Shabbat Shuva Shabbat Shuva Also named for the Haftorah Not because it's time of Shuva But because the Haftorah is Shuva Yisrael Ad Hashem What's Chazon? No Yes, the vision of it's just the first word of the Haftarah. Chazon Yishayo ben Amotz. First parak of Yishayo. First word of Yishayo. Because, because this is one of the few Haftarah that you're actually obligated to say that's mentioned in the Gemara. Most of them are not. There is no Chiyuv to say specific Haftarah. I know that, but I never think there was a Haftarah in the Haftarah. Yes, the three, the Tlata de Puranita, the three of Puranut, of punishment, and the seven that follow are mentioned in the Gemara, right? The, the, the Shiva de Nechemta. Those are mentioned in the Gemara. The rest of the Parashiyot are not. Most of them are not. No, no, that's not what I said. I said, I said the specific Psukim. Meaning, the, what you say for the Haftorah is in the Gemara. The rest of Haftorah is not like that. The rest of Haftorah, they're different minhagim. You can say whatever you want. You, right? you could say, these psukim, you could say different psukim. There, were, there, were, there used to be all types of minhagim that on a, the Shabbat Chatanim, there was, you would read one about, about a wedding that had nothing to do with the parsha. Right? Because there was no set psukim. It's the, there are certain weeks where there are certain Haftorah you have to say. But most of the year, you have to say the Haftorah. That's it. But what the Haftorah is, 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 is not dictated by the Gemara. It's dictated by Minog. No, not that. What? Not, these, not that you say the Haftorah. What you say in the Haftorah. I, I, I guess I, I do have to ask. Um, is it actually true that like, uh, they tried to somehow, like, that they specifically chose uh, Haftorahs that were connected to the Parsha? Or is that like... Or is that kind of like... Different? No, they did. Ashkenazim did. Ashkenazim did. Okay, okay, good, good, good. At least I have that. that. Like, okay. The Ashkenazi... The Ashkenazi minog... The Ashkenazi minog of Aftarot are to try to find parts of Navi that are thematically connected to the Parsha. And the Hanami, of course they are. Okay, okay, good. I, I would just like to pray like this would just be like a later justification for us having... 
No, no, no. That's why he was chosen that way. Yossi Ofer wrote his dissertation on this, pointing that, that our tradition, the Ashkenazi tradition, but there were other traditions that, that cared more about linguistic similarities rather than thematic similarities. Right, that they would look for a haftorah where the words that started the haftorah were similar to the words that started the, the parsha, even if they thematically diverged. Whereas ours followed more thematic connections. There were different traditions. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, they do. Not, it's not as common. I know that one of my chavrusas tried to convince the shul to let him do it. Um, it, was, it was at Renat. He tried to get Roy Adler to, uh, to convince him to, to let him do it. Um, I'm trying to remember if he actually did it or whether he let him do it in the end. He might have. I don't think he did, but he might have. He tried. He tried. He definitely tried. I'm trying to think if he did it. Uh, I have to ask him whether we, we we had long discussions of trying to get him to do it, but I don't remember whether he did it or not. What else do they do about it? There's all types of different minhagim. I mean, on Hayom we have different minhagim, right? We have ones for Shabbos, Rosh Chodesh, Erev, Erev Rosh Chodesh. But there were all types of different ones. So really there would be not so much of a problem, like, because, like, in the first row, it's like, well, Bob's up there, and they do a shorter on Torah. So if we just did there, and the soaker was one of yeah, hundred percent fine. Like I'm not telling you to go against the the minute, but yeah, it wouldn't be a problem. Not always, but yeah. Oh, do you know how many times I'm just praying there? I'm just like, please let whoever because in in a lot of shuls in Israel, the minag of the shul is whatever the minag of the balkore or the baltvila is. Right, and I'm always like praying for like a Temani to get up there for like Haftarah, because then it's like a third the size, you know, because <laughs> we'll just follow whatever they do. And yes, you'll be fine. You don't have to like go find somewhere else to do the Haftarah. You're fine. <laughs> you know, you're you're totally fine. <laughs> what? Twenty one. Twenty one, except when it's shorter. Yeah, I feel like I've seen one that we're. <laughs> you did. The rule is 21 except if it's shorter. I don't want to get into the rules of Aftorah. We are, we have gone on so many tangents today. I, which is fine, which is fine. I have, one of my teachers once noted that people remember tangents much better. So what he does is the things he actually wants you to remember, he hides in a tangent in some other shear to make sure you remember. Because if he gave a frontal shear, you would never remember it. But now, everything we said today, you'll remember. You won't remember the main point of the shear, but everything else, you'll remember. <laughs> Well, that's in. That's not in Navi, is it? That's in Chumash. No, we don't. We don't switch around because that. No, no, no you're not supposed to be switching around, except when we do. We do sometimes. We're not supposed to do that. That's not the point. You're not supposed to do that. No, but it's supposed to be that you don't have to be turning back and forth from books. We do it. It's bad. It's a problem. We do that sometimes too. We do that in Israel, not in America. In Israel, we do that, right? On Sukkot, that's what we do for our Kriyas Torah. If you noticed on Chalamoid, I mean, yeah, but like, for the Haftorah, just like not for the Haftorah, for the Parsha, right? We read the same Aliyah, the same three Pesukim, four times, the exact same one, over and over and over again, right? We read what you br- the carbon of that day for every Aliyah, over and over and over again, right? In Chutzars, you don't. You do like, anyways. Yes. So let's go. So the Gemara in Ksuvos Davches says as follows: Amr Yosef, my crack is Tomei Nu Lamarod Daminu. So my adulation with Varshem Ktsinei Stom. You already said that we're like Stom. So what is Yeshayo adding by saying, "Hey, you leaders of Stom"? In Pshat, there's a lot that he's adding, but not for now. So Amr Lei, Kum Ema Milta Kenege Menach Avelim. Say something. He said, Our brothers are kind, and they're the children of kind people who follow the covenant of Avram. Yishalim 
Now, let's do a little bit of academic work here, okay? Uh, academic and lumdish work at the same time. So, the, it's talking about being kind. Be, being kind. And all the kind things that Jews do. And then he quotes the Pasuk of? Breshit Yuchet Yutet. And then, at some point, somebody added? Parentheses. What are parentheses? Adam, what do parentheses tell you in Gemara? Very good, except there's actually a machlok rishonim, whether this girsa should be in or not. Now I want to ask you, why might there be a machlok at whether this pasuk is properly quoted in the context of talking about all the kind acts of chesed that Jews do? Very good. As if you think that staka means charity, so it makes sense to quote a pasuk about giving charity when you're talking about how kind Jews are. But if you think that staka means... Mishpat is justice and Staka is compromise. That's a very bad source text for the notion that being a child of Avram means being kind. And guess what? Do you think Rashi puts in the parentheses and removes the Pasuk? Rashi who thinks that the word Staka there means compromise and not charity? Very good. Rashi doesn't have the Girsa, right? So that's a little bit of fancy, fancy footwork for you, but it, right? but it shows you that there is a consistency to this. Right, that there do seem to be does seem to be a running parshanu that staka here does not mean charity. It means something else, something related to justice and you know broader ideals, but not like the act of what we would call charity. Okay. But Rashi is not the whole picture. There are several major rishonim who, in fact, suggested that. Non-Jews are chayev in staka mamash. So, technically, I think I'm doing this out of order chronologically, because I think Rabbeinu B'chayi is before the Ran, but the Ran is on, our, is on the Gemara in Sanhedrin, Rabbeinu B'chayi is all of Torah. So let's look at the Ran. Okay, who's the Ran? Rabbeinu Nisim. So I think we already talked about the fact that he's, right, he's of the Beit Midrash, the, the Ramban, but he's several generations down. Okay, so here's the Chidush Haran. Okay, who wants to read the Chidush Haran? Don't all, don't all offer at once. Oh, Rami, thank you, good. Ran, this is the Ran and Sanhedrin, Nun Vav Amin Bet. Okay, so he commanded on him the laws, and this is what he said. So he owed that. Okay. So Hachanami, Hachanami, Havile. Okay, he's pretty clear right of the way. He should have said. No, Havile lemichshav. It should have considered. It should have included staka, because non-Jews are chayiv in staka. Dachtiv, because what does the pasuk say? Very good. Why isn't it mentioned? Now we have to be very careful. He, the Ron argues that they are chayav in staka. It's just not mentioned. Why is it not mentioned? Yeah, because why? Because it is a positive command. And the Sheva Mitzvah of B'nai Noach are all negative. Don't jump on me and say Dinim. We'll get there. We read one sentence, right? But the point is that the Ron thinks that Arnanj is Chayv in Staka. Yes! 100%. And I, the Gemara, doesn't say they're Chayv in Staka. That's because he's only listening to the prohibitions. And Staka is an assay, but it, given, they are in fact obligated in Staka. Uh, Rabbi, does this imply that... Uh, we yes, have, Adam. Who? Uh, we say Zedekah here, do we need compromise or charity? Yeah, he seems to mean charity, and we'll see. Right? Um, 
I'll show you why. Let me let me read a few lines, okay? They don't tell me that it doesn't that they aren't chayev. What's his proof that they're chayven staka? The Gemaran. Nun Zayin. So now Adam has the good question, which is, okay, but maybe they're chayven. What Rashi thinks staka is. And then he says, And we know that non-Jews are punished if they don't give staka. Why? Because the Pasuk says, Viyad ani ve'evyon lo hechziko. That the hands of the poor and the destitute they didn't support. So it's very clear. What does the Ram think Saka here means? Charity. 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 Supporting the poor. And he says in no uncertain terms, based on the Gemara and Nunzayin, are non Jews chayv in Saka? Yes. I, why is it not mentioned in Nudvav? Because it's an Asay, not a Los Asay. Yeah, they don't have to believe it. Who said they have to believe in God? They can't worship Ojazara. So, so, okay, so uh, according to them, atheism. That's a good question. But it's de- it's not one of the Shem Mitzvahs, per se. They can't they worship they idol- idols. Oh, it's a lack of itself, uh, positive. Yeah. Um, no. Um, okay, so so let's skip, skip, guys, skip to the third column here to deal with that question. Go six lines down, one to the six lines down. Avalinian hadinim, guys, 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 third third column, got it. Have you lost your sources? Um, yes. Yeah. My everywhere. So what you're saying is I can just I can just assume you know everything by heart, so you don't need it. Well, Torah is everywhere, not all Torah is in everything. Yeah, I feel like we've just moved Torah in, into the pantheism, panentheism uh, discussion, uh, and it's confusing me. <laughs> but it's bad enough when we do it with God. Now we're doing it with, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> but the Ron says, Shayidei, <laughs> etc., And he says, um, it is a mitzvah I say, right? Yeah, you know, it's an exception. Okay. <laughs> it's sick to love him when I say, it's the exception. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. I can't, I can't help you. Now, look on, look on the next page. No, it continues, but he's like, yeah, that's an exception. That's basically what it is. Um, look on the next page, guys. So I gave you, um, specifically, I gave you the version from the Mosadar of Cook um, because I wanted to, you to look at the footnotes. So just look at what he notes in the footnotes on, one, on no, footnote 176. He says, Mashma, de stuck a mamash. It sounds like the Ron thinks that non-Jews are really chayv in staka, meaning what we call charity. Okay, may Rashi, Masha refers to staka, I knew pshara, but Rashi seems to think not that way. He thinks it's compromise. Um, and he says, and look at the Rashi. Ba'in ma'ashak, 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 Rashi, ma'vur, b'me'iri, she'kat avnei noch, mitzuvan ala dinen, v'ala pshara, t'shenemar latsot staka o mishpat, u'kfar hitbar, sh'tzaka ze bitzua. Now, it's important to know that some of the Yachonim think that Rashi only thought that in the Hava Amina, but the Maskana, he actually agrees with the, with the Ran, the Derchayev. But that is a little bit unlikely. So let me show you a few other Rishonim on this, okay? Let's try to at least get this out. So look at the next source, Rabbeinu Bechaye. So Rabbeinu Bechaye, there are two. Right? There's the philosopher, and then there's one who wrote on Al-Hatera. We're talking, this is Al-Hatera. Um, 
And he writes the following in Breshit Yudchet Chaf. He also says in Andrews or Chayven Staka. What's his proof? Oh, no, it's no. What? It's no, it's no. Yeah, he said in Stone they didn't do and they got punished. If you get punished, you can only get punished if you were supposed to do it. I, 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 I mean, I, I feel like they were punished for something else. Than it was the fact they didn't do stuff, it just they didn't like. Well, you, the, you could have said that, I, I, but what's his proof? What What's his proof? Is that? It's in the context. Avram did Stako Mishpat, Stom didn't. He's the contrast. And in Yeshayahu, when he describes what what the people of Stom didn't do, what didn't they do? Was that Yeheska who said that? It's Yeshayahu, it's Yeheska. But no, we're in the first paragraph of Yeshayahu, where he calls them Kitsine Stom. Right? What did they do? They weren't helping people out. They didn't help poor people. Correct. His proof is contextual. Also in Yeshayahu, it sounds like the problem of Stom is don't give Stako. Meaning, meaning, they don't help poor people. Right? So, Rabbeinu Bechaye says, Lefi shahayu tadir mechet zelakach nigmar gzardina malav. Shere'en lecha umma ba'olam shaloyat zitzedaka el elu em elu. Because there is no nation that doesn't do char- doesn't give charity. Va'anche stoma yim u'usim ba. Va'yu achzarim b'tachlit. The people of Stom did, were disgusted by charity and were Achzarim b'tachlit. They were intrinsically evil. The avel pishlo nitna Torah da'in. And then he says, "Ah, you'll tell me how could you be obligated in staka? This is before the Torah. What does he say? He de he ne at staka min a mitzvot ha muskalot. Staka is a rational mitzvah. It's rational." V'davar mituav hu shira adam et mino mutal barav hu ashir v'savei amikal tov ve'enu merachem. It's a disgusting, right? Morally reprehensible for someone who's rich and well off to see someone starving and not have mercy l'ashiv et nafsho. And therefore, it doesn't matter if you formally are obligated. You are obligated because it makes sense. And therefore, even before the Torah was given, you're obligated. Period. You are chayev nikuda sof pasuk. Non-Jews are chayev in staka. Like then you're a bad person. You're stone. That's his point. Yeah, right? It is objectively bad. Oh, okay. Objectively immoral. Yes? I mean, I, I feel like you can go so much further with the uh, stone example. Because uh, as far as I can tell, like, there's a huge amount of, like, which one? Uh, before team, like, Midrash team, uh, as far as possibly two hours, that, that, that talked about, like, uh, the evils of Sodom that they, uh, that they refused to uh, give charity. It, we, yes, and they'd more than that, and they would, if they had guests, they would stretch them, right? Or they, I, I mean, I mean, right? Or cut their legs off, so, right? Uh, they would put them, there's an English phrase for it, what's it called? Sorry. Look it up. That's your homework for tomorrow. Figure out the Eng- the English phrase for the bed that Chazal attribute to the people of Stone, where they would cut off their feet if it was too long, and they would like stretch. A bed. What? A bed. No. Like like this is your homework for tomorrow. So I feel like like was like ultimate proof that like because like there's like this like pretty much this universal like. Yes, that's his point. So, so, so I, I mean, how does anyone ever get around? Uh, so, so, like, I it feels like this should be like, like, like I should own to be like one of the first things you mentioned. Like, as it like seems obvious that, that, that they do have this uh, uh, that that non Jews have this obligation to charity. I mean, we can look at at, at the, the fact that everyone disagrees, that everyone uh, condemns the don't want those grounds. One second while I send out the Wikipedia page for you. (laughs) Very good. Thank you. Now I don't have to send it out. But where does it come from? You'll see. Greek mythology, yes. And it becomes a phrase about enforcing conformity. Very good. You can read it and explain it for everyone tomorrow. Okay? But yes, now you have it. Very good. I'm glad you found it. Good. Now, I'm surprised that Yehonatan isn't jumping in and saying, okay, 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 okay. Maybe, guys, 
maybe people should be giving staka. But why do you have to formalize it? Right? Maybe the fact that you're talking on this level of rational, moral mitzvah that everyone can understand, maybe that means it's a value, but to call it a mitzvah chiyuv in the formal way, maybe not. Well, it sounds like it has to be because of the comparison between um, what happened in Yishayahu. Well, not necessarily. Why not? Right? Because it could just be, it's, so one oblig- point is to say, look, this is obviously something you should do, and if you right, and the fact that you get punished for not doing it shows it's a formal chiyuv. The other is to say no, they're formal chiyuvim, and then there are things that you should just be doing because they're moral. And yeah, you'll get punished for not doing things which are. I don't know how much of a difference there is. I mean, there might be technical differences, but you could just say the same thing without over formalizing it, which the Ron did or Ben Abachai did. The Nitziv makes this critique. Okay, so if you look here, this is a fascinating piece and I, I just I know I tried to cut down stories but I, I thought you'd appreciate this piece in the Nativ so I included it okay the Nativ was asked by the Chavetz Chaim or probably as they said it Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Huda Berlin was asked by Rabbi Yisrael Meir HaKohen right or Kagan was asked to write a Haskama to his works right and ap- right to write a letter of approbation to his work so he sent him the Sefer Ahavat Chesed. Ahavat Chesed is the book written by the, by the Chavetz Chaim, which basically formalizes all the rules of Chesed. That's what it does. So the Nitziv writes a Hakdama, which is sort of like a Haskama, and sort of like a very backhanded compliment in which he makes it clear that not only does he not love this book, he doesn't believe in the entire philosophy that led somebody to write a book which formalized the mitzvah of chesed. Okay? Um, and Benny Brown has written a has written like a dissertation on this. That the Chavetz Chaim has a tendency to over-formalize what for many other Mepharshim was general moral religious values that were specifically not codified into law, and the Chavetz Chaim makes them into very hard and fast law. So the Nitziv writes the following in his Haskama slash Agdama to Avad Chesed. He writes as follows. So you wrote this book to teach people about Chesed. Let me explain. These two things are contingent on each other. Let me explain what I mean. The Be'emet, Klal Gmilut Chasadim, Hu Kiyum HaOlam, Uktiv, Ukedichtiv, Olam Chesed Yibane. Yeah, the world is sustained because people do Chesed. That's true. Vihi Chovan HaAdam. And it's, you're obligated. Vizeu Tsurato, this is your very essence. Umishum Achiktiv, Bereshit Abriya. He said that's why he thinks that the world that the first, that the Torah emphasizes that Adam and Chava had two sons because definitional to creation is that there is brotherhood that there are people helping each other this is the Nitzv theory of life okay and he said, Kayan probably originally supported Hevel with his vegetables. I don't want to get into historically whether this is right or not. It doesn't interest me. But he says, For this reason, non-Jews are also obligated in, in kindness. So he said the reason it isn't counted because it's positive. It's a positive mitzvah. And that's why the people of Stone were punished because they went against the essence of man. Jews by our nature are commanded in this. Etc. Now, the Nitziv does say they're chayev, but if you, right, but is it a normal chayev? No. Right, what is it? 
Meaning he does say they're chayev, but what type of chayev is it? Yeah, I mean that's what he's saying. He's saying they're chayev because that's what people should be doing. Oh, good. It might not. I Meaning you might not care, except it's it's important not necessarily for our suga because in our suga I don't know how much of a difference there is to say they're obligated because it's a quote unquote mitzvah or obligated because it's basic morality. I think the the just, the important reason to read the Rebbe Nachai and the Nitziv is because toch kedei you get their theory of life, which is that there's more to life than and not just Torah than like formal obligations, right? They have an assumption that basic morality is binding, is normative, whether or not and they just take that as a as a given. Um, yeah. If you really think they're not chayiv at all, then yeah, it might be. It, it might help that they are. They have to do it because it's basic morality. I mean, you can also say that basic morality doesn't mean that you have to touch an obligation. Right. But you can't. But on the flip side, you can't. You can't say you have basic morality. You could. Now, it's it's unlikely that Rashi himself would believe that because Rashi has places where he clearly indicates he doesn't like people doing things for the basic morality. Like, not just, he doesn't think you're obligated, like, he thinks you shouldn't do it. What? Yes. Rashi has this comment in Sanhedrin Dafayin Vav, where he says, I guess we're going to end with this, where he says, the Gemara says that it is bad. You should not return lost objects to non-Jews. Um, now, there are different reasons that might be true. It could be because it's, it's talking about only about idolaters, and they'll end up using money for bad things, or whatever. That's not what Rashi says. Rashi says that if you return a lost object to a non-Jew, then that shows that the reason you gave, you return lost objects to Jews is because you feel like doing it. But you're not supposed to do it because you feels right. You're supposed to do it because you're chayev. And if you give it to, to a non-Jew who you're not chayev in, it shows that you're doing mitzvot not because you're obligated, but because you feel like it's the right thing to do. That's not the reason to do mitzvot. You do it because it's, an, it's a yoke on your shoulders. And if you do it when you're not obligated, that's terrible. No, that would be if you were like the, the Rambam and you were a virtue ethicist where you thought it was supposed to develop your character. Many point to this Rashi as saying the opposite. No, no, we don't want this. It's not what it is. You do it because you're obligated. The value of the mitzvah is submission. And if you do it when you're not obligated, that shows that you're doing it because you identify with you think it's right. Bad. We don't want you to do it because it feels right. Do it because you're obligated. I found the wallet in America. I have a good opinion to hold that I I didn't say that. I said Rashi. We should qualify. The Yerushalmi, on the other hand, says that... tells the story of Shem Ben Shetach, who... He returned the jewel, exactly, and the Gemara says, why do you return it? You didn't have to, and he says, his very, very formal response is, V'chi barbaro na'ana? Am I a barbarian? Right? Right? Like, he's like, what, are you crazy? Right? I'd rather him say, Brich um, elad de Shimon ben Shatach. Blessed is the God of Shimon ben Shatach. He returns his object. And it, basically everyone says, that, look, if there's going to be a Kiddush Hashem, that's a good thing. But then we have to get into it. Is that a technicality? Like, you shouldn't be doing, but it's a cheap way of getting Kedush Hashem? Or is that saying, if you do it because you think it's right and God wants you to act a certain way, then that's okay. It's not because of the normal mitzvah of Shavad Aveda, It's because of this broader value that God has an idea of how the world should look. And if you tap into that, ide- that ideal, then that's great. Uh, that's important to note. So I'm not saying you should not, right? I'm not, you know, Rav Luchlinstein once said, right, he, was, he walked by a group of, uh, of more um, yeshiva, it was a very famous story that he told, I guess we'll end with this, right, of more yeshivish youth who were, uh, who saw a non-Jew who, I forget exactly what it was, they dro- he dropped something, needed help, whatever it was, and he saw a bunch of, uh, of yeshivish kids arguing whether they should help him or whether it's a violation of lotechanim and, you know, etc., and Ravaran said, you know, his, at that moment he said his problem was as follows. He said, realistically he knew that many people in his own community wouldn't know the sugya where, which would imply that it might be problematic, but they would intuitively know that it's the right thing to do. On the other hand, you had this group who were learned, they cared about Torah, and they knew the sugya, 
but they were clearly not doing the right thing because they were over right they were over formalizing it and thinking of this and rather than realizing obviously what they should do is help and he said his ideal community would merge the strengths of both of these communities people who have a moral sense of what's right and are aware of the sukkot and then can actually you know deal with the the confluence of these and, and deal with the tension and, and actually work through it. The problem is it tends to be that people are Mishnah Savot, right? And that both are problematic. Um, but yeah, sometimes people know too much Torah, but don't have common sense of how that should be applied, and that leads to very moral, immoral uh, conclusions. That, I think, is uh, definitely the case. Okay, we didn't get through all the Rishonim, but I'm hoping that not just... Do we see this? But this brought into your idea of, right, part of what you see is that this sugya ends up becoming not just a localized question of the Chayev Tzedakah, but you see that in the middle of it, Rabbeinu Bahai, the Nitziv are starting talking about meta pictures of what is the nature of mitzvah. It doesn't make sense they wouldn't be Chayev. And obviously all that's important when we get back to why are we dissuading them, right? Meaning, if they're Chayev, that's weird. If it's not just that they're Chayev, but this is like basic morality that you should know that you're obligated in, even without doing that, why are we stopping the non-Jews from? Because non-Jews are bad. But we are, we are Chayev are bad. Those are two distinct, those are two very different formulations. Um, good. Okay, tomorrow we'll see a, um, okay, tomorrow let's finish up the, I, I gave you, um, a few more sources. Guys, what I want you to do tomorrow is look at the Rokeach if you can um, and try to plug this back in Baba Basra because now you've seen both sides, right? They're Chayev, they're not Chayev, and they're Chayev but maybe because it's basic morality. So two and a half sides, right? Plug it back into Gemara and Baba Basra, right? Now say, okay, well, as I said, why do we stop them from giving Staka to us, right? Why does that make sense? Right, figure that out. Okay, that's your, that's your goal for tomorrow is to... May you read the Rokeach, may the Mashachachma, and the Rambam. I gave you three sources. If you want to look at them, great. Start plugging them in. Um, and then I want the next set of goals is to figure out what we started with, which is okay, well, what's the problem with taking? Right? Right? That's, that's really our next move is okay, we've seen all the possibilities where they're Chayev, but we know that there are cases in which it's problematic to take. Why? Right, that's really that's that's how we got here. If you remember, I know it's been a few days. That's how we got here. We got here because the Gemara seems to take a pro- have a problem with us taking stucker from them. Now we've seen several we've shown them who say they're chayev, or it's basic morality. Of course you have to do it. So why would we not take it from them? Good. That's your that's your, that's.